Hey, what's up guys? So I am going to carry on with my grommet method uh, videos, but for today you've got a long video. Uh, this, this is a bit of a bonus for you guys. Um, we're, we're going to share with you one of the Chess Bootcamp Live sessions, the complete session, end to end. Okay. Now the first half of the session, I volunteered to uh, play against the whole Chess Bootcamp Live group also led by Craig, who is 2100 rapid player. Okay, so the question is, place your bets. Can Hunty hold his own against a 2100 and a bunch of other strong players, including James as well, who's a 1900 player. So lots of fun. Um, enjoy it. And uh, the reason why I'm sharing this with you is because I want to promote Chess Bootcamp Live. We've changed the format recently. We were trying to do four sessions every week, uh, kind of four one-hour sessions, and it was just proving too much. So what we're doing now is we're doing, really got on one main session a week. Um, so each coach is doing one session, and we're stretching them out to two hours, which we feel like is, is um, it's better for us as coaches to um, allow us to do more preparation and to really build up to one main session in the month. And then we're also gonna do a session as well at the end of each month with all the coaches and we might do like a bot game. So this video comes in two parts. The first part is um, the, the, uh, the battle between me and everyone else. And then the second part is really kind of a Q&A where everyone gets to jump in and ask somebody who has risen in just what, two or three years, I think it is, from 800 to 2100 on chess.com rapid rating. And uh, you know, we get a bit of a Q&A. It's lo lots of fun, very interesting. Enjoy. Hi everyone. Yep, so the purpose of today's session, we're going to play move by move against Ben. So I'm just gonna send Ben an invite and I'll share my screen and uh, we'll, we'll kick it off. Here we go. All right, so we're off then. So this this is us. Out of interest, Craig, are you going to play an opening where you know the theory, or are you going to try something different? Well, hopefully, if Ben just plays e4, I'll play e5. So okay. I won't be going down like a Sicilian or something that I'd maybe prepare a uh, play. Sorry, against like if I was playing against like a, a serious, um, not like a serious opponent, but if I was trying to win, I think it's the Sicilians my preference but when I'm playing for fun I don't mind playing e4 e5 and try some some tricky stuff but this is a long game so we'll see how it goes but e5 is a fairly nice and easy reply to learn it's um when I'm doing my private coaching for example it's something I've always recommended people start out with I know you've got Caro and Sicilian and Alton French and everything else but E5 is just like an easy reply to create an open board to not have to know an awful lot of stuff. Yeah, um, I'm, yeah, I'm definitely quite interested in this opening against a Vienna where mm -hmm. I basically play something silly that I shouldn't. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, that I sort of just made up myself. So well, I'm quite quite interested to see how you play it. I mean, I think D5 is the only move for memory but i haven't played. yeah this, this is effectively transposed and yeah D, d5 is the the main line um does anyone else have anything that they've played before in this position appreciate that you might never have had this position if you don't play knight f6 no i think d5 is the standard yep mm -hmm. so we'll go for the center and uh normal our knights being attacked so we're going to have to jump in to the middle Normally, Queen F3 is quite a common move, but... I, I know that's what Ben usually plays. Mm -hmm. um, we'll see if he does it. That's what Christina taught us, too. To do, to do this as white side? Cool. Yes, correct. So this is probably the point where we can actually deviate. Um, there's a couple of moves here. Knight C6 is one of them. Knight takes Knight is another. Um what do, what's people's thoughts like this is probably although we're only in move five it'd be interested to i'd be interested to ground the group and um see what your candidate moves are in this position
I think I'll still be looking to um, develop Craig. So bringing Dark Square Bishop up to um, C5. Okay. Um, or possibly push the E pawn by one. So you've got another um, protection of the pawn besides the queen. Uh, okay. Um... What were you suggesting there, sorry, the e pawn? Yeah. Is that the e pawn? No, sorry. The c pawn. I'm reading right. backwards, aren't I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you were looking at this move just to reinforce this. Yes. Problem with that move, I think, is that the knight will take our, our knight, we will take back, and then the queen will take our pawn. Probably. Yeah, I was, I, I was going to say, I guess the threat at the moment is that at present we're, we're looking like we're going to lose a pawn. Mm hmm. Um, so, mm -hmm, yeah, I haven't got much further than that, but I yeah. So I mean, yeah, we don't need to spend too much more time on this move, but yeah, generally speaking, there's a couple of ways you can play here. I think knight c six is one line, and knight takes knight is the other. I've always played knight takes knight. Um, couple of couple of options after knight takes knight, which I'll play first. First of all, if the queen takes, I mean, the whole point is that we we, we can damage the pawn structure immediately, and if the queen takes back, I don't think they really want to do that. Because of maybe queen check and queen here. So the queen's probably not going to want to jump over here. Also, if the queen takes as well, I guess we could even kick the queen, making them waste waste multiple moves and we can always develop behind it. But I, I must say that I don't know much theory in this opening because it's not an opening that's that common in terms of like what I experience typically so there may well be some some better candidate moves is there a name to that open uh, this is called the Vienna oh yeah, yeah. the okay. Vienna but then it's like there's obviously it's a chess.com is calling this the Paulson attack which yeah again, I'm not up to date with the theory so I don't know if it's I'm assuming it's Ben that initiates the Paulson attack and not me yeah the, the, que the Queen F3 move is the Paulson attack I've, I've don't know anything about it just mm -hmm. so i've seen ben play it and it is called yeah. the attack and it's defined by that move mm -hmm. cool um all right so here yeah what we'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll blast through maybe the next four or five moves and then we'll pause at the middle game but here there's a couple of moves that i know are playable i think queen h4 is one bishop e7 is one and c5 is one i've always played c5 point being i know that they're going to try and clamp down in the center so i like to just take that out Quite often, so I'll play c5 just to try and get some control of this square. My experience playing f pawn gambits as a white player is that bishop e7 is a really useful move for black in a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not I'm not saying right there. I'm just saying that in general, it's quite useful. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll be aiming to play that at some point anyway. Um, okay, so yeah, the point of me playing c5 was to take this pawn. So that's what I'll do. And there's pluses and minuses to this setup. One, one kind of negative could be my isolated pawn on the d file. Um, but then White also has a backwards pawn on the C file. So maybe some point in the future, I can get my rook on C8 and start pressuring the, the backwards C2 pawn. So it's kind of um, balanced, I would say, in terms of the, the weaknesses potential in the position. Yeah, sorry, can I ask a question about this? Like, mm -hmm. I I wouldn't um, have thought about the, the pawn move we played last turn. Okay. I wouldn't have ended up, what wanted ending up to be in a position with these like D and E pawns that White has, but you're you presumably you you're not that worried about ultimately about that construction in the center. And uh, certainly not in this position. Um, for for two reasons. One is that there's actually a tactic here for us to win a pawn. So that, okay. that was a mistake. Um, Queen H four check, forks the king and the oh, pawn. I see. Yeah. Um, but even even if for whatever reason, um, that wasn't an option in this position then 
I still feel the backwards. I would more be fixated on the weakness in the white pawn. So the C pawn and the A pawn. So I'd be like, okay, they might have a strong D pawn, whatever. I'm not going after that for the time being. I'll be going after C and A. That's really helpful. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, for example, like the rook here, queen up, for example, maybe eventually the knight up. And you're just looking for ways to mount pressure, for example. I was going to suggest uh, for this move that you just did, um, bishop to um, uh, b4 check. Mm -hmm. And then if the qu white queen comes over or if uh, it intervenes, then you would go over to, to uh, h4. Okay, so after, let's just go back a move. So on the assumption we played this, the pawn would probably come down and kick the bishop. Right. Supported by the queen. And then that also removes the option to play queen h4 because it's now defended. Mm. Right. Yeah, it removes the tactic. Yeah. The tactical element of that move. Oh, this is great. Mm -hmm. I love this. Yeah, pretty much any opening where the f pawn is moved whether that's in the King's Gambit, the Vienna. Okay, this is actually a, a, a decent way to, to block. I actually didn't fully register this. Um, but first of all, I can take that queen and damage castling rights, which again, isn't the end of the world because when queens are off the board, castling rights aren't as important. Um, I know that some, sometimes we feel like we're getting a significant compensation for damaging castling rights by exchanging queens, forcing the king to move. But generally, um, I'm never really that fussed if I'm the one that has to break castling rights because queens off the board means the king's safety is not as um, big of a priority. Yeah, that's something I've only just sort of come around to, which is that if the queens are off the board and you've removed castling rights, it's not a big, as big a deal because you're basically in an end game already. So. Mm -hmm. Is now so the that, time to what? check the queen with the bishop? Sorry? Is now the time to check the queen with the bishop? Yeah, uh, check the king. Yeah, I actually was looking at that move. I think now that's that's a nice in-between move. Um, because one immediate thing I'm noticing is if we play mm -hmm. bishop b4 check and the white bishop blocks, they'll be losing a piece because we can take that bishop. Right. It's and the king can't take back because it will lose the queen. Looks uh, like a good move. So I think this actually might just be. In fact, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because yeah, the line is bishop check. Right. Only two. I mean, if the king moves. Well, the, the only move is king e2, yeah. right? King e2, yeah. And I'll probably. King e2, if I chuck this move in, you'll get knight takes. Hmm. Uh, or knight block, sorry. I'll probably take anyway. Okay, let me just let me just calculate. I mean, to be honest, like, and I'm just being um real here in this type of position, I just sensing what's going on with their king position and everything else, I wouldn't actually put that much time, and this probably isn't the best thing to say, but into looking at like two, three moves deep. I'm just like, okay, bishop check, the king is dodgy, that's good enough for me, uh, especially when there's no incoming threats. Obviously, if it was a really sharp position, I would have to calculate more deeply, but in a position like this, I feel comfortable just playing kind of one-two movers, because we're developing with the bishop check, because that's a free move. We're then able to castle in one move. They can't castle at all after that. So that that's enough for me. Um, but what Peter says is correct. After this, realistically, the only move is king down because we know they can't block with the bishop because we'll take the bishop and the king won't even be able to take back because we've dropped the queen. So after bishop check, again, if pawn comes down, we can just take. So after bishop check, this is forced. And then... I would probably at that point not exchange queens because the whole point is if the king can't castle and you exchange queens, as we've just said, it's not as bad for them 
if the king can't castle and it's in the centre, I would keep my queen on the board. Yeah, I mean, you can even, I suppose, after king e2, you could even play queen, I guess, e. Oh, queen, queen, e, queen e4 was it was an int- was an immediate move I looked at. Then probably queen e3 would be played. But then I've got queen takes c2 check. Right. So if they block, I've got this check. So that actually seems like a more... You would probably find that move just by playing this and this. It's easier to see. But that seems like that's the direction we're probably going to take in this game. Yeah, I, I, I don't remember who first suggested bishop to um, g4. I think it was Byron. Uh, yeah, Byron or Richard. I didn't even think about that. But as soon as I thought, but as soon as you pointed it out, I was like, wow, that's actually quite an annoying move for, mm-hmm. for white. It's certainly annoying, yeah, once the queen's off the that square. Definitely. Um, is there any so it looks like we're we're pretty comfortable with the, the bishop b4 line, but um we've got so much time and there's this expression if you see a good move, always look for a better one. Does anyone else have any other candidate moves that flashed into their mind? Could you take the pawn? Uh, D. The D pawn, unfortunately not, because the queen. No, with the queen. Yeah, yeah, the queen's backed off. Yeah, so that's the only move I see. Otherwise, we're going to have to retreat the queen because it's, we are under attack. Oh, yeah, or trade them, right? But yeah, and I, yeah, so I don't think I want to trade because we've got so much more in the position. So, um. Again, it's, it'd be quite easy for a player just to snap that off because they're getting something small for it, i.e. damaged castling rights. But yeah, this is definitely stronger, in my opinion. That's the best move. Yeah. So now after king e2, I think we're going to play queen e4 check and then pick up the c2 pawn. Although, again, that's not completely forced. After king here... Queen here, check. If they block, we'll take the pawn. But after king down, queen e4, the king could theoretically go back here and defend the pawn. So if that's played, I mean, we've got this move to chuck in. But again, the knight will probably block. But at that point, depriving the king of castle rights does feel like a victory. Yeah, yeah, this is already good enough. Yeah, with equal material, I would, you'd have to evaluate this as being. Uh, all borderline decisive advantage for blacks, probably like minus some, minus two. Minus You're already two. ahead, I think. Yeah, well, it's equal material, but we're yeah. we're definitely ahead positionally. New yeah, tempo. Mm-hmm. Yeah, with development as well. Yeah, predominantly because he's moved his queen twice or three times. We've moved ours once. Okay, here. So as advertised, um, so yeah, this, this was the initial move that forces the king back there, and then at that point, yeah, we are then I think fine to continue developing our castling. Like knight, even would be an interesting move. Immediately pressuring more weaknesses, for example. Um. So. So yeah, and like, is there any other sort of suggestions or candidate moves from anyone else? No, I, I, mean, I think everything we planned was based on that move. Right? Yeah, yeah, and it's just a shame I've not had this move because I would have loved to have given another check. <laughs> what about the other bishop? Just, what about bringing the other bishop out? To... Here, I just think, you know, knight jumps down and then my queen's still hanging. I'll have to move the queen. Okay. And, yeah, bring so, it. So I would that, rather... That's also like another thing that I've really struggled to learn is like making sure you're, if you are playing your queen out relatively early it has mobility mm-hmm. and that that bishop move to to g4 does sort of block our queen off from a lot of the board yeah a lot of the side swipes that we're yeah aiming to get so yeah i think this is sufficient king d1 looks forced to me because there's no way to block otherwise they do drop too much so queen e3 or bishop e3 fails for the same reason. So I'm anticipating king d1. And then after that, maybe knight c6. We could castle, but I would, I mean, knight c6 just looks like it's it's threatening to come in even more. Like we could we may as well just keep throwing punches at this at this king. 
Okay, yeah. so the Queen has box. So I have to admit, if I was white, I would have played that too without thinking too much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so... Hmm. This position should require a little bit of calculation. So first of all, I mean, I think it wouldn't be correct to just uh, simplify off everything. Because we've then let Ben off the hook because his king is that dodgy. Uh, even though we'd be simplifying because we're a pawn up, but I think it's probably still worth it for us to keep all this tension on the board. So that bishop is pinned, it can't move. Um, we've also, I mean, there's also an option of taking this bishop to divert the queen to then activate the queen a second time. The queen could block though, and there's no other sort of check because the bishop's still here. <laughs> I will say the first idea that occurred to me, rather than just a candidate move, mm -hmm. is getting our light squared bishop into play. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and this this is a really sort of attractive looking move. I just don't want to allow them to develop. Right. So that's why yeah. I, what I wasn't thinking about it in terms of a candidate move because if I was going to try and get it into play, it would be via. Uh, a move like um, B6. Yeah, B B6 I actually would would, would prefer. Uh, we also, I mean, so the bishop, our bishop on B4 is, um, this is pinned, so we don't have to react. We, like, we actually don't have to do anything with either of those two pieces right now. So, yeah, a couple of candidate moves. B6 could be interesting, just with the idea of playing bishop A6 check. What about the queen to B, uh, B2? Uh, queen b2 hitting the rook possibly as well yep yeah. and then the rook will have to move probably the rook will move well, the, the and it, oh yeah hang on yeah take the rook maybe well we can't yeah we can't force the uh i mean after queen here the rook will probably just move yeah yeah i mean even rook to onto the c file is a little tricky for us right yeah in that case we'd probably just play knight c6 to block the bishop or castle yeah maybe we need to get uh, another piece out yeah I, I mean so i'm looking at the candidate moves bishop g4 knight c6 for me um resisting the temptation to castle just because it, purely because their king safety is this crazy so one interesting way to come up with a plan or candidate moves is this concept called imbalances which I only really use when I've got a lot of time to think about it. Uh, so in that that book, How to Reassess Your Chess by Silman, um, which is like a sort of well-known book, although I um, appreciate not all of us have, have maybe read that book before, but one of the main concepts for it's about middle game planning is um, have a look at the board and determine the imbalances, meaning what are the, what are the main differences between our position and theirs? So if I was to make that assessment here, I would say, the king safety is probably the biggest imbalance in terms of that's the biggest differentiator between our two uh, two positions. So when you identify the main difference, then you want to potentially analyze or review candidate moves that surround that imbalance. So that will stop me from making generic moves because there's an imbalance on the board king safety. Therefore, can my next several moves revolve around exploiting that? So, so would you actually consider uh, B6 here or, or not? Yeah, B, yeah, I would consider B6. I think I, I personally am leaning towards Knight C6 just to get another another piece able to hop closer to the king. But B6 is also, I mean, it's a legitimate candidate move I would consider. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I was sort of interested because um, looking at Knight C6, I, I didn't really understand what the next move would be after knight c6 okay yeah so a couple of things could be knight c6 right and then let's just say for talking sake random move which is obviously never going to be played but random move uh you're already th i mean we could be playing bishop takes for example queen would have to take and then you can jump in with check and the queen can't take because it's pinned so there's like some just little elements of picking right. up more, more loose pieces or loose pawns for example um, obviously that's on the assumption white just completely disregards that threat but even if that wasn't a threat just generically having more development again when your king is a bit questionable can only ever help I would say and it does also help you know again if we just play a random move 
you d- you do have rook here, and then if the queen moves out of the way, you do have rook takes. So the knight would actually def- kind of do a lot of good things for us, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, yeah, I was definitely concerned about leaving that bishop on the c file, but um, I didn't think about it in that connected way. Mm. Yeah, so yeah, I'll just jump ahead and play, unless if there's anything else. I mean, okay, so this I have momentarily considered, but you literally the only reason why I'm not warming to that too much is just because the less pieces this guy has developed in protecting everything, the better for him. The knight would also defend this. So I just don't want to help my opponent develop. So that's pretty much it. And again, I know castles is a very instinctive move here, but again, looking at the imbalance, this king is a big target, so I can afford to delay castling because there's certainly no incoming threat of my king being hunted in this in this position here. And now Rick C1 is a is a reasonable candidate move. What do you think you would do in response to Rick C1? I, I mean, I was just thinking about that because of what you said, and I, I'm guessing uh, the first thing that came to my mind was was uh Queen takes on A2 if he had played Brook to see. So, yeah, knight, knight f3 is a good move. Any thoughts here? I'll give you, I mean, I've got an immediate thought, but I'd be interested just to sort of go around the group and hear how it... I think my, my immediate thought was just, if you if you do now play bishop to g4, pin the knight, you can go forward with the plan. Yeah, I mean, yeah, so that's, that's one candidate move, yeah, for sure. Anything else, Joseph Richard Byron? I was thinking the same yeah. thing. Mm-hmm. Bishop G4. Is Bishop F5 um, probably get pushed away? Bishop F5, yeah. I like Bishop F4. Simple reason just being that um, we're kind of hindering his development by pinning one of his only developed pieces. Like all of his pieces after that will be pinned to some extent. Um, so it's almost a bit of an illusion that there is development at all after Bishop G4. So I'm happy to play that. Okay, so thoughts here? I'll tell it you it's a right in the chat to, to Ben. Chris. Sorry, did Ben say something in the chat? I said, uh, day to write that in the chat to Ben, that, that his development is an illusion. So I will say I assume this would be the response, and kind of for the reasons again linked to actually playing knight knight c six. I do think we should take here. Mm-hmm. I'm not always keen on that exchange, but here I think it makes a lot of sense tactically to just take and carry. I think so yeah, and ultimately it's removing a defender, arguably from the king as well. So that that has to um, be a good thing. Because what we've we've got effectively right now, four pieces developed around the king. They've got a couple of defenders. The bishop, technically, the knight could argue is a defender, although it's pinned. The good thing for us is that a lot of their so developed pieces are pinned. But yeah, if we retreat the bishop, for example, they're just going to unpin the piece. And there's no other place I think we can move this bishop where it's doing a decent job like i just don't want to free up the night like so the other thing i thought about when i thought about this move is it is in theory sort of forcing i think because 
I think the only move is to take with the the G pawn in in response, right? Because otherwise, they I think White drops a piece. Yeah, yeah. Here, yeah, they drop the bishop. Mm -hmm. So we'll we'll get a. Not again. Not that I'm really thinking about an end game in this situation, but we'll have a couple of isolated points to to sort of um, contend with, so that that can only ever be good for us, even if we have our own win. But our our isolated pawn doesn't have an open file to target it. But yeah, I'm just going to snap this knight off first. Uh, instant recapture and yeah, thoughts here. We can definitely, I think, win two pawns here, and possibly. Line I'm calculating is bishop takes, forcing queen takes. Well, if you, put, you can put, if you take the knight uh, to and take the pawn on uh, d4. Yeah, so what, what I'm seeing is bishop takes, forces queen takes, then we can jump in with check. King, yeah. if, depending on where the king moves, we can take and then take here. And then at that point, I'm although I'm happy to then exchange queens because we've got three pawns. Mm. And probably also then winning this pawn, which looks quite difficult to defend. And then you can justify liquidating because we're up so many pawns. And it's just having that kind of ability to not be too invested in keeping queens on because right now it looks good, but I think it'd be completely, completely good for us to exchange off everything here and just go to the, the end game. But I'm also interested to hear anyone else's ideas. Um, it's not an idea. It's the first thing that occurred to me was c castling either side mm -hmm. to get a rook into the centre of the board because yeah. we've sort of dealt with the C-file threat. Mm -hmm. So we're safe. We don't have to capture at the moment. But mm -hmm. I, I, hadn't, I hadn't got as far as thinking about the fact that we can win pawns with a tactic. Yeah. It was just my first instinct was to get a rook to the centre of the board. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, I'm, I'm just realizing that once we um, take here and the queen takes back and we jump in with check, once we take the queen, king takes back, we will be, we'll actually be jumping in and forking. So we'll be actually winning all of this by force. So I think that's good enough for me. But before I... Uh, it's never it's never by force if it's not check. So I just need to sort of make sure there's no other checks that they can do on us. But it doesn't look like it like instinctively i mean there's no open line to the king but that's you know if this diagonal was open for example and the, the queen was able to give a check we should definitely resist the temptation just to jump in with it but i think this is looking good enough I think he has to take because we are threatening the queen. And if the queen moves out of danger and doesn't take back, we're threatening a discovery. So they, I think that they are forced. Well, isn't there the potential for him just to drive the queen over to d3 to offer a queen exchange? Yeah, but then, then I've won the piece for free. I will take, take and just retreat the bishop. And I would have won this bishop for free. The one that I've just taken. Ah, uh, yes, okay. So, yeah, so there is a pin here, so the queen can't take the knight. I, it's interesting because we I mentioned earlier this sort of E and D pawn construction that White had, and like this whole attack has just completely dismantled the that construction. Yeah, but I think obviously I think something went wrong with the automatic recapture with the C pawn. I don't think that has to be good for White like all the way back here. Um, right, we'll have to look this up, but 
yeah, I think I think probably this is the point where it probably started tilting for us. Because up until this point, it's all fairly mainline. This is probably zero zeros up until this point. Right. Um, I wondered whether it was, whether there was also an issue with with queen. Yeah, queen back to f two. Right at the start to block mm -hmm. the check, but maybe it was the pawn capture. Um. Okay, so. Sorry, I, I know it's said a lot, Craig, but with with end games here, mm -hmm. one thing that I sort of observe with like GMs is if they've got a knight in the middle of the board in end game. Instead of moving it, they'll just say play f six to support mm -hmm. knight and just leave it there. Um, if... F six was the probably the move I was going to play there because there's no point hopping it about. Like they will, they're going to win the deep one regardless. So. Would you castle short here? Uh, you would drop the knight in that scenario. The rook wouldn't quite cover e8. So if we castle, the rook will come here. They can take the knight. Oh, you're right. Yeah. If the bishop was here, for example, then we could play that move because then you could just get a skewer. But there's nothing on that file, so we probably have to defend the knight. I my first reaction was actually this move just because it's a check. So obviously when you're looking at candidate moves, you want to look for all the checks first. But like I don't think any of these necessarily do anything that good. Although you could maybe argue the knight hovering about here is but I mean it's just going to allow them to develop with uh, with tempo. So um yeah, I think I'll play knight f6 and then f takes, we've got castles with check as an example. Probably go for that. So, in terms of I, like I, at this at this stage, I'll still be thinking of an overall plan. Um, and the plan for me is is just simplification. So that is the extent of the plan. It's not it's not some other. Um miniature goal it's really just if i can exchange ricks exchange the knight for the bishop i'll be really happy with that so in this case would you then look at moving the knight to d3 with check mm -hmm. with the view that he may take it with the bishop yeah, and then yeah. recover it? i don't think he would um but if he did that would be good for me because i can activate the rook and also simplify off another piece right but, but then, yeah you've got to worry then about king to c4 right Hmm. The the thing with that one though is if you that if he doesn't do anything about the uh, rook, if you took the rook to f two, he's likely to move the the rook out. But you've got that for pawn. Um. Okay. What we what we're looking at here? So just knight check, for example, and let's see. So knight check. King up. King up. Mm -hmm. Then knight to f two. Mm -hmm. Rip down. Uh, let's just down. Yeah, I mean the knight can still hop out, but then again, you're you're allowing him to develop with temple. The knight will yeah, have to no. move away, and then maybe rook here with the bishop. So just... one move I thought about here is like mm -hmm. rook rook to d two. Rook d two is another thing I've just sort of considered in the back of my mind, just to double up rooks and also get them active in this second rank. Could be useful. I wonder if we move the queen to b1 and then get the rook over there. Yeah, that's also an option. Um, between the two, I'd probably prefer... Actually, rook d2 probably looks good, just because it activates that rook. Can the... Uh, to come in. Can the uh, rook uh, go up to d2 uh, and mm -hmm. uh, kind of like stop the uh, a rook from moving away from the a pawn? Yeah, that could be another function of rook d2. Certainly a few ideas on there. Anyone else get anything that they're really warming to or maybe had like an initial gut reaction after castles? What is it they say? Move, move your worst piece? Yep. Yeah, so rook e8, for example, would be following that principle. That's another logical candidate move. 
Um, but I actually must admit, I do probably quite like the idea of Rook D2 followed by Rook D8, and then potentially even moving the Rook and getting them both up here. Um, but yeah, it's between probably these two. King B8 is also just a, a natural looking move, just to get the king a little bit more sheltered and also give me two or three open files. But but it also makes their um, light square bishop a bit mute as well. Mm -hmm. Because that stops any potential checks if you move to B. B8. Mm -hmm. It's great listening to your thinking process. Nice one, yeah. Certainly, uh, yeah, uh, definitely anything that you're thinking of. Um, then definitely feel free to shout that out so that we can also give you feedback on on that idea or that line as well. I think that's also quite a good use of everyone's time actually on this call. Okay, so immediate thoughts to this? Hmm. What? Is there a potentially... Uh, uh, well, I wouldn't move my knight. <laughs> no, it's all right. I'm just seeing something else. Mm -hmm. I mean, reality is in this position, we're probably winning in quite a few lines just because we're up material. So any move that's basically not a blunder will be good here. Um, natural, just I'm sort of going back to the generic kind of. I still move, move that queen to be one. Okay, that's one idea. Um, so yeah, King B1 is, is one option. I think also Rick D8, Rick HD8, just because again, this is a, a, a piece that's not doing anything. I think that can only be a useful move for us in some cases. I mean, actually, after Rick here, I've got a, a concept which is Rick down and then the second Rick up for me. Okay. As a concept. And it's quite difficult to stop that because neither of these routes can ever challenge us, Rick, as soon as we're doubled up here. So he'll have to spot that and immediately go walking with the king. Or not immediately, but I think like if we get two, two moves, which obviously we probably won't, but um, it's just quite nice that the, these uh, squares are kind of cut off. Yeah, I, yeah I, I didn't really understand why, but something about that just geometrically looked weird with the bishop mm. next. Yeah. You know, I didn't see a mate at all, but he just felt sort of restricted. I'm, go I'm going to chuck this in, because I think all the other candidates, so just to be clear, king b8 is a nice, a nice move. Um, after king b8... I mean, you've got the threat of rook c8, but the king can always move to here. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think rook d8 is strong enough. Yeah. So the, the, the plan if we get, you know, like the next few moves in a row is rook d8, rook d4. Okay, so now there's a threat of the king moving with check, which isn't a significant threat, really. Um because it's not like the king can move with check and win something, for example. So we don't need to be petrified of this alignment. Um, I will come down here and actually prevent the king from moving to b4. Craig, Good move. could you actually do the same thing if you went to b2? b2? Uh, well, the rook won't be supported then. Uh, yeah. So... Rook d4 anyway, which is stopping the king moving, threatening this. <laughs> That's such a brutal mate. Yeah, the, the other, when, my other instinct was when this was played to play pawn up, just to let you know, to also cut that square off. But I didn't like that because pawn up actually gives him this square. So it was like, okay. Um, that's why I preferred the rook, but the rook also supports. I mean, the rook would support this check from up there anyway, but the added advantage is that both squares are covered at the same time. 
Is it? Yes. Yeah, I mean, is that that's the only way to stop yeah. it? Is it or not? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah it was. Um, yeah, it wasn't stoppable. Is the bishop being there or not still had the rook coming out of it. Yeah. Yeah, still covered it. Um, all right, so. I think I think that was still instructive in terms of even when we were ahead in material, just seeing how we would both continue or how we would all continue from that position. Because uh, even if you give a a sort of winning position to all of us, we'd probably all play it completely differently. We'd branch off into a completely different plan. One of us probably would simplify. One would keep everything on the board. So I think that was that was quite a nice game to have. So I'll wait for Ben to rejoin. I mean, technically we do have time for two of these games because we've only used like. 45 minutes in reality because we were talking for the first 10 um so once Ben comes back we'll sort of see if we'll play another game or if we'll just analyze this game and then maybe play a 15 minute game at the end or take a mistake <laughs> or a mistake yeah well, I'll wait for Ben to join and we can analyze it together um, I mean, I mean but... that, was, that was enjoyable mm -hmm. no it wasn't <laughs> <laughs> <It's> all right, <laughs> Ben, you, you've done worse to me that was horrible <laughs> I, feel, I feel dirty. I feel like I'm <laughs> <laughs> Oh, great game, guys. Seriously. <clears throat> um, yeah, it was the C5 pawn push that got me. You know, it was that was right out of the blue. I don't know if I've ever seen it before. I might just nip over and check if I've ever come across that. I doubt it's in my preparation well aspect. interesting yeah cool that's that's because that was actually our that's the only move i've ever played in the vienna five pawn push. yeah um the c5 pawn push ben right because yeah. I, I i said uh, when that happened that I, I would never have played that move is that it would never have occurred to is me it a, is it a way ben to see like my own opening tree is it this thing here yeah oh these well i mean these are my games i think Oh wow! But I think I've probably played more than that. But all right. So actually, I mean, again, this is probably over my entire rating range. But C five is a move that these days, if this was filtered on the last year, would probably be the only move I'm playing. I don't think I played Bishop E seven all that often. Um. So this, is this, this is, is this the master database then, or is this? No, this must be mine. It's only thirty. Six C five, yeah. Yeah, C five. Yeah. I've I've actually faced it seven times, and it's three three one. So three wins, three losses, and a draw. Oh, well, hang on. Then is this? Are we looking at the same? Because that's what this is as well. This is three wins, three losses, and a draw. Uh oh. Maybe this is some explorer that we're both seeing. Yeah, these are master games. They yeah. are master games. Yeah. 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 Wow, um, shows how infrequently uh, that particular variation is played. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, I was thinking like the sample size is way too small for it to to not be our games because there's no way it's only been played seven times. But that, yeah, that's 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 um, I'll uh, I mean, this is how I analyze games basically. I'll also use opening trees, so I'll do kind of like what I would always do at the same time. Yeah, um, but yeah, let's just go Craig and then black and then advanced filters, and I'll do from. Let's just say the last year. And no, I do not have C5 in my. Um, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. No, I, no, I've only got one line. I've only got one line in this. And it doesn't include C5. Um, but on the. The Lee Chess Players database across the board, it's 48% for black, 46 for white. So along with Queen, the immediate Queen H4 check, it's uh, it's it's the best response. Yeah, so you see, I'm always taking this night. This sample's too low. I think the, the engine's still searching for all my games. Um, but here, no matter how they play back C5. Is my kind of default reply. Um, although, what? Well, yeah, what was this where you took back, wasn't it? Yeah, here, c5, d4, c takes d4. Yeah, I think d4 was premature. I know that. Yeah, that, that's probably what allowed this, this, and queen here. Yeah. So we'll see what the 
the main line should be. So let me just filter on 2200 now. Oh, yeah, I could do that. Yeah, so yeah, C5, slightly strong. Okay, Queen H4 immediately is a line I'll probably look at after this because it's got quite a high win rate, but it's also got a low sample of games. But C5, yeah, that's the line I play. Uh, yeah, okay, so Queen G3, which I mean effectively prevents both this bishop moving and this check. So that's quite a useful move, actually. But yeah, D4... C takes D here, and Queen H4 just seems maybe a bit too, too strong. Queen F2, Bishop B. This is kind of like how our game went. All right, okay, so back to the... So I just, yeah, I just wanted to review that opening just to see like what should have been played. Um, cool, so let's go back into it. So it would it'd be interesting to know, Ben, at which point you were out of book. I guess it was just C5. Yeah, 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 yeah. C5. Well, in fact... You know, from even playing D4 at that point. Um, yeah, 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 no, yeah, C5. C5, mm -hmm. it, like I say, it's not even in my in my study. Cool. So what's what do people actually play here then? Is it normally knight C6 or something or bishop E7? Hang on. Um, so most common, C5 is fourth. We've got... So uh, uh, for the full Lee chess, Bishop E7 is first, 21%. Um, yeah. It's pretty much equivalent to Knight C6 and Bishop E6, mm -hmm. then C5. C5 is far better. White is clearly better on the first three. Yeah. C5 is, is the best. Queen H4 actually um, is only 44% for white, 49 for black. So in yeah, it's... Queen H4, it doesn't do so well. The deeper this engine goes, the more it's like in Queen H4 check as well. I think I think I did notice that that was quite high up on the list, mm. uh, or not high up on the list, but high up in the win rate. But yeah, C C5 has been the sort of default move I've always played, just because I I am um, I've never really been a fan of allowing White to have this uh, center. Sure. Yeah, I actually said in in my commentary as well um, that I know that like D4. At the wrong time is is a common mistake in the mm -hmm. post. Um, but I'm interested to know was was the C5 move? Did that come straight from you, Craig, or or did the group find it? No, it was Craig. That was straight from Craig. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it, but it, it wasn't because like the other ones are obviously worse. It was just one of these sort of. It was this early on in the game. It was just like. Okay, what what do you what do you all want to play? I've always just played C five, so that's what I'll do because it's like in the spirit of my play style. Um, but yeah, okay. So takes takes Queen H four check, uh, and I miss Queen F two. Like I just thought I was winning the D five the D four pawn. Um, so Queen F two is a a nice defense. It seems like the only move to defend. Yeah, uh, and we discussed a few other candidate moves. I think um, we had Bishop B four check as an option as well. Um, but okay, so bishop b4 is actually stronger than we first thought because I just saw this and this. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's just interesting because the engine's top choice is king d1, which means that there must be some concession to this. But I think every human player is playing c3 here. Well, oh, I suppose the d3 point is it's a, it's a move order thing with the q8 queen h4 check, right? Is exactly it. so. If we just it, instead of leaving the queen hanging for the bishop check, we just leave the bishop hanging for the yeah. queen check. It's the same position. And we've got queen takes d four. Oh no, you don't. Yeah. Oh yeah, queen oh. takes d four and and uh, pinning the pawn on the rook and the a one rook could mm -hmm. be could be yeah. Um, but yeah, I think we I think I just favoured this one. Um, so, and I think it is actually objectively stronger. It does look like it keeps an edge or main, almost minus two versus like, I think it was like 0 0.5. Uh, but okay, so queen blocks and then we chucked in this move. I think this was a better order because the king is kind of committed to defending the queen. Mm -hmm. uh, and we sort of looked at if you block with the bishop, you'll drop a piece because we can take yeah. um, with I check. I said king e2 was forced and played it pretty yeah. quick, I think. Yeah. Exactly. It is. Um, we looked at bishop g4 check, but 
Um, just as a general uh, principle, I just didn't want to allow you to bring out another piece. Yeah, it would be knight, knight three immediately. Exactly. Hitting yeah. the pawn, hitting the queen, you know, and just, you know, anything that I could do to simplify. Yeah. Dogfight, so, I've been very grateful for. So the, the line we were looking at was queen e4 check, and we sort of deduced that king d1 was forced because any block would allow the subsequent follow-up. Um, so I'm interested in this position. Did you, what were you exclusively just looking at blocking, or did you consider king d1, or did that look scary because you're you're moving the king, kind of, away from the pieces type thing? Um, I th I think it was going to be queen e3, mm. uh, whatever. Ben, I actually said at this point that like, I would didn't after we talked about it i i realized king d d1 was the best move but i would i would absolutely have played queen e3 in, in your position absolutely it's very human i mean you, you're trying to simplify your way to safety mm. uh, I mean, I think, yeah yeah if, if it just purely wasn't for the fact that i was able to take this point that would definitely be the default move 100 yeah. percent. yeah um so okay so queen e3 c2 well, there's all turn the uh, white turn the evaluation and lines off first. It's always good just to have a look at it, give our own thoughts, and then we'll turn the engine on. But bishop blocks. Um, we were contemplating. So one of the one of the, the the ideas here was just to take the bishop, and then take the queen and just simplify down. Yeah. Um, but I sort of thought that your king safety becomes less and less of an issue if I have no pieces left on the board and neither do you. It's like, in fact, like you could even argue that's that's good. That's exactly what you want in this position. Even though I'm up a pawn, I just felt like the the king safety element, I would want to keep that as an imbalance. Yeah, the, an, move, the move order that you found there, I think you won like an extra pawn as well with the hmm. clever. Yeah, so here I think there was a couple, and also I wanted to resist the temptation just to castle because I just thought again, I sort of spoke about this concept of imbalances, which basically very loosely says that one idea, to, one way to come up with a plan, and I'll just say this again just for everyone else, um, one way to come up with a plan is to look at the main difference between your position and your opponent's position. And in this, I would say the main difference is the vulnerable king. That's like the classic. Everyone could point out that difference. So because of that, you should focus your plan and your candidate moves first, potentially. Obviously, it's always tactics. You always look for checks, capture threats. But that aside... Having said that, at this point, Craig, mm -hmm. uh, there are two kind of p clear potential threats as well. Mm -hmm. Potential threat for white is the e-file that I was very much aware of, the fact that my king and queen were in line. So mm -hmm. I was really a bit scared of you shortcastling and then rook e8 and f6. Right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, if, if you'd have gone, if you'd have castled at this point, I was going to play queen d3 and try and trade off the queen's or persuade your queen to vacate the premises and then get my king off the e-file, right? Mm -hmm. Were you aware that at this point as well there was a threat from your side of, of rook c1? Yeah, yeah, we, we sort of discussed that as a group, and that's why... Um, Which would have been losing. Yeah, yeah, we, we sort of... I think I mentioned, like, if we just play a nothing move, you've got rook here, and the queen basically will, will come down and, and this bishop's a goner. And the rook. Yeah. Um, so that's why I think knight f uh, knight c six was like good for two reasons. One is that it does actually facilitate a lot of tactics. So, for example, here takes and then this check because the queen would be pinned, so it couldn't have taken, which is what happened in the game. Mm -hmm. But coincidentally, also stops all this. Yeah, closes off the c file. Yeah, so because I Ben, I I I was looking at uh, pawn to to b six, which would have. But yeah, that was also an interesting concept yeah. just to bring this other bishop in quickly. Because mm. I never really liked the idea of bringing the bishop this way just because it allowed you to develop, even though we'd probably snap it off anyway just to remove a defender around the king. Yeah. Um, but that also would really that's what we did as well if, if that had happened. And I was quite happy about that. And yeah. connect rooks, which I really wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, and then just castling was the. Castling is a, another logical move here. Um, the only reason why I didn't want to 
like it was never a move I really wanted to play just because I felt like it was a little bit slow, meaning that the, the whole castles, rookie A, F6, there's still many moves before that E file opens up. I would have to play F takes E, yeah. for example, and then yeah. like every, everything else. So yeah. uh, that's why I was like, okay, I can leave the king in the center. I'm at no risk of being attacked right now. I'd also, um, I'd also counted how many moves it would have taken. Yeah. So it, it, was, it was a bit quite distant attack. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's why I, yeah, another reason why I favoured knight c6 again bringing another piece into the attack mm. um, so then we move to knight f3 um, and yeah bishop g4 again didn't put like a, a ton of thought into this it was just a case of it's a natural developing move it also pins one of your only active pieces um, and also allows flexibility to castle both ways so there wasn't like a, a lot of brute course calculation here Um for me, but yeah, any comments or any other candidate moves that you were sort of calculating or worried about or thinking about? No, I mean, you know, it, it felt like already for the last kind of six moves or so, I'd been, you know, like King Kong at the top of the Empire State Building and trying to, trying to swap biplanes. Yeah, yeah. It felt like this, you know, yeah. I was in a tactical... Um, yeah. Cluster mess. Yeah, and there, yeah, the reality is, it's just it, like from this point on, it's just a really, really tough position. Um, so yeah, no uh, yeah, it's it was really just I think that C five novel like move that caught you off, and then from there you're just in the back foot. So pretty much anything I do, it, it just it's, it's allowing me to to play with the initiative. Um, <clears throat> I think ultimately though, if I ever find myself in a position like yours, the main priority I'm looking to do is simplify, as as you suggested at the start, so getting the queens off. Because that by default eliminates a lot of the pressure, mm -hmm. um, and then if you can get rid of bishop for the bishop, etc. Because again, wonder if you would have taken the the pawn on d4 with your knight on c3, what would have happened? Um, what are you calculating here? Knight on c3. Right, taking the pawn. Oh, c6, c6. Four. So you're looking at this. Right. It would well, put, the, put it in check. Uh -huh, and it. If it was pick. taken by the queen, you could have taken his. No, you couldn't. No, I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just thinking. I was thinking out loud. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally, definitely. Uh, but yeah, the queen, the queen defends, and you might be even tempted to think, well, knight takes, queen takes, and then chuck this in. But again, because if the king takes, for example, you drop that piece. But the pawn would take and the king would still defend. All right. So it's a tough one. Yeah. So h3, we momentarily considered the implications of rerouting the bishop. For me, this was a no-no because it just allowed you to untangle oh, yeah. one of your only developed pieces. Oh, so the only the only realistic kind of candidate move was retreating the bishop here. But I just thought like, although it might be useful, I'd rather just it was more 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 about your king safety is compromised. Let me remove one of your only developed pieces around the king. That was pretty much it. It wasn't wasn't much much deeper than that. I think they're giving knight for bishop. It's like zero point one pawn of a difference. The knight versus mm. bishop thing. But if we allow that pawn push of like g g four, and they unlock the bishop, they unlock the rook. I think that's disaster for, for the mm. attack. Yeah. So right, yeah, because, but, yeah, the material like balance isn't that different, right? We're up one pawn, but we've got all the space. Yeah, all the threats. If you allow that push, the G pawn push, as James was mentioning, is yeah. Every, every move I give away for free basically is just a move that the opponent, like Ben in this case, can try and survive the attack, simplify off, like move the queen and try and get a queen exchange. Because I'd imagine, like, if I let's just say. We'll turn on the evaluation here and I'll just play hypothetically here to see how much this drops. But let's just see I go back, right? And then so, so, already yeah. there's a big big drop there, actually. Yeah. And let's just say, worst case, we do, we do something like this, right? Oh. Uh, I'm actually surprised it's still as high as that, to be honest. Yeah. Um, but I guess you're winning a pawn because you can take this knight and then you can take this bishop and then you can take the pawn. And by default, this pawn's probably going to fall. 
So that's probably why there's still actually quite a lot of play for black in this position. But generally speaking, exchanging queens would sit the side that's under pressure. So as a, a, by default, when you're on the opposing side and you've got a lot of pressure around the king, the opponent's king, you don't want to exchange off. Unless, and you did, you did it in our case, where we're doing it and also managing to pick up like one or two pawns right. in exchange. So then it kind of means that the end game is more favourable. But yeah, and I'd be interested to hear what you, you think of this, Craig, but th there's an extent to which the engines are super useful, mm -hmm. but in terms of practically how easy something to play is, like mm -hmm. that, the engine doesn't tell you that. And mm -hmm. like at, this position is much easier to play for Black Cat at the moment. Whereas the moment you sort of devolve, you simplify a bit, yeah. white gets a bit more space, it gets a bit easier to play. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah, bishop takes f3, g takes f3, and then we just went down this line of takes because the only recapture was queen takes. Um, and then fortunately, we were able to find knight, knight check because I think that was a really nice move. Yeah. Um, and just but coincidentally, I think, I think as I saw it, I saw we were taking this, but I didn't realize it initially that taking this is also another fork. Queen takes, and then we got to pick up this. Yeah, it just kind of all worked out. Yeah, yeah, and then here there's, I mean, I, I sort of made the point at this point where you could pretty much play any number of candidate moves. Obviously, you need to defend the knight, but whether it's f6 retreating the knight, castles long, castle short thereafter. I think the main priority now for us would be simplifying just because we've got more points. So I think that's what we try and work towards. F6, castles. Um, there was a couple of options here, actually. I think, um, again, like at this point, pretty much you could probably turn the engine on like every line is probably good for us. So it doesn't really, there's no point putting too much energy into like all the possible candidate moves. But I think this was a, a natural looking move, as was this. Um, but more so just to develop the rooks and potentially, you know, in the future, double up and go more pawn munching, but there only really is one pawn, so that's maybe not the best use of the use of our two pieces. Um, but yeah, one, one basic expression is um, when there's no tactics on the board, you look at piece optimization, what's your worst place piece? That could be an undeveloped piece or it could just be a piece that's on the wrong square, like a knight finding its way to an outpost or a bishop finding its way to a better diagonal. Um, so when we think of what's our worst place piece, definitely the rook. Um, so by default, there's now a couple of moves. Rook e8, fairly logical, or moving the rook with the idea of then developing a second uh, being doubled up. So I think rook e8 is perfectly logical if you were considering that. Um, after playing that, you see the engine maintains seven. So it's like it doesn't really make any difference. Um, but I like the idea of doubling up the rooks because that also stops you from ever trying to, not that you would want to trade off now that you're down two pawns or three pawns, but. Um, uh, and then I think it was at this point we saw this concept of a mating net where your king was kind of stuck. Um, yeah, so I think, I was, yeah. No, no, I, I'll correct Craig here. Craig saw the concept of a mating <laughs> net. The, the rest of us did not see this concept. But it was. Right. Yes, uh, I, think. I, don't, I don't feel so bad considering that I didn't just lose to the whole group with a mm. combined yeah. 94. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, like even like pretty much from this position, you could flip the board and you would you'd win every time. I think it's black. It's just you're when, once your king's a bit dodgy, as long as the opponent is sharp enough not to simplify off, I think it's just really, really tough. I think you could have sniffed blue for the rest of the game and still won. Yeah, that. yeah. It's just once the king's compromised, that's that's basically it. Um, yeah, and this was, I think, it was like the the critical move because we were sort of discussing. Well, you're threatening to move the king with check, but like, does that king move actually really do it? Like, like you can't move with check and like threaten a piece, for example. So it was like we weren't. I wasn't as fussed as dodging it immediately, which I probably would be in a normal situation. But I just thought any king move you make, I just back off into the corner. Normal situation means when you're playing a strong opponent, that's, that's what you mean. It's just with equal material. Equal material, I would say. But when you've got that slight edge. Um, momentarily look to a5 to also rob your king of here, because this would also still still be a useful move. But you would then have king yeah. b6. 
I mean, the reason I moved my bishop is I realised my king only had b4. Mm. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, so maybe then to, to avoid this checkmate threat, maybe this. Because then if I play this, you can at least... No, I could take the rook. Oh yeah, take the take the rook. Never mind. Yeah, I was just saying what you you've given yourself a shield, but that that, that would, first of all, yeah, that would stop that idea. Um, I would probably just simplify at that point, though. Yeah. Like, but I was thinking, just shoot me in the head at this point in time. Yeah. <laughs> and then probably just something like that. Yeah, put me out of my misery. Yeah. But cool, yeah. Um, any other sort of thoughts or comments on anything, any, anywhere else this game could have went? I mean, yeah, I think it was just one of those opening things, and from that point on, there's not a lot you can do. Yeah, interestingly, when you did play C5, I considered mm. the engine's strongest move, which I think was, was it bishop b5 check, and dismissed it out of hand. Yes. What was it saying? Queen h3 there? Uh, seen a couple of moves. Uh, Queen G3, which seems to be one of the main lines, which basically gets out of this whole check idea. Mm. Um, yeah, let me just toggle onto the master database one more time to see what what should what is typically played. So Queen G3, Bishop B5, Knight E2 seem to be the What's strongest. The, there's a blue and a red line. Which which what does that mean? Uh, so the the red line is just the move that was played. The blue line is just I, as I hover over the other moves. It's just these are the other these are the moves that I'm highlighting to play d4 bishop b5. Yeah, um, with, with opening tree, with opening tree, none of the arrows are engine recommendations. They're just what was actually. Yeah. Put. Yeah. Oh, all right. Thank you. Yeah. So, so the, to answer whose games are these, this is just an aggregate of the Lee Chess player database. So, unlike Chess.com, the Lee Chess database is public. Um, well, although, yeah, obviously, chess.com you can plug in usernames, but I think I don't think chess.com aggregates all of it in, into this. Um, so these this is just the sum of all the games. So 400 games basically just means 400 online players rated 2200 and up have played, um, such and such a move. Okay, can I can I ask about C five as a candidate move, Craig? Like, mm -hmm. it it just it wouldn't occur to me, right? Because in the opening, I'm sort of obsessed with developing, mm -hmm. and so I I don't know whether you can actually sort of break it down into something that's thematic. Like why, why that in the first place? Why not? Right, just like, is it the connect three that? white gets in the center if you don't do that yeah it's that was that's one of the reasons i mean it's uh, yeah i don't have like a massive like proper defined reason for why but you, you, i i like i know like after this d4 is a good move and then it gives white this sort of nicer center so i, ju I just like pretty much since i started playing the petrov um like at 1700s i just kind of think i looked up like c5 was a strong way just to stop that center or at least try and slow it down. And I've just played that ever since without really debating all the other candidate moves type thing. So, um, but you can see that looks like a decent position for white just by playing one of the standard moves. So C5 just aims to try and discourage D4, which some people still play. You know, almost half the people still play at 2200 now. Um, so, um, Yeah, so uh, Bishop, uh, well, well, I think it would be valuable just if you are a, a Vienna player, just to toggle the board from White's perspective and just see two or three lines after uh, each candidate. So Bishop B5, for example, I think I would probably play Bishop. I think my instincts tell me this, even though that's the worst move, clearly, but I think I'd probably play this. I don't think I'd want to play this. And I'll, like... I don't like that position. Um, but here, okay, they normally take and take. And then d4. My queen's not on the diagonal. So that looks like a sensible way to continue. That seems like a relatively. That whole, like, yeah, the bishop check makes it look like a bizarre Sicilian in some sort. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, 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 a nice version. Okay, interestingly that more people are still not taking it. I just feel like you should be taking here. Um, I don't know what the engine would say here. 
peer analysis. I think it's assessing all of them more or less equal. Like if you look at the actual percentage point difference, it's the top move. But I mean, they're, they're basically all, all the same. Um, I, I feel like I'd be, I'd be more comfortable playing this position um, than the other one, just with the ones already there. But nevertheless, I think that's that's the continuation then. Ben, if you get this position again, if they play C5, I think this looks like a good move. And then D4. Yeah. Could be a, a, a reasonable way to continue. Alternatively, we may as well just look at Queen G3 because it is the main line. Queen G3, what would I play? Probably Knight C6. Yeah, Knight C6. And that's obviously discouraging D4. So what would you play? Probably knight f3 looks natural enough. I'd probably play bishop e7. Okay, bishop e7 is not a popular choice. But yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd, okay, bishop e7 drops at one, so that's probably why that doesn't look good. So bishop e6. Yeah. Garbage. Mm -hmm. Mean having no where. Maybe G six is also a, a, an option here just to stop Queen takes. Yeah, because I actually now that I'm seeing this line, I don't actually like this position. So this queen g3 looks like a decent move as well, provided black just plays all the natural moves, because I, I don't like this position for, for black. Um, maybe this. Okay, what's, I mean, what's the big deal after this? Takes, queen takes, castles. I mean, I think these win rates are also skewed just by the small sample size. This could be a completely equal position. Um, yeah, but I, I mean, at least in high level games, it is a little bit weird to long castle with the C pawn. Yeah. Up, right? I mean, I don't know why, but it just. Yeah, long, long castling, like into this. Yeah. And like this queen is awkwardly stopping me developing in this side. So that's why G6 was an option. But what does G6 allow? Probably take. Have it then. But that's not really a big issue. Pin that night. But okay, cool. I mean, we've all we've deteriorated into like a long line of. Um, mm -hmm. But I just, I just thought it'd be good for you, Ben, as well, just to see like what the two positions look like. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, either or, it's just good to see. You know, three moves later from both lines, what one looks more comfortable for you to play, like naturally or intuitively, without having to research it too much. All right, so we're, we've still got like 35 minutes left. So open to suggestions for what you want to do, even if you want another one faster game, 15 minutes. Or I have a suggestion. Mm -hmm. Go on. Sorry. I was going to say, I'd be quite interested to see what uh, puzzles look like at your level, Great. Mm -hmm. Can do. But I mean, it's just more so like what you think as a, and I'm, as like a, a value add for, yeah, true. for everyone. Like, do you think it would be? I'm happy to do that, but it's just do you think it would be the best use for everyone to sort of struggle with uh probably not puzzles that are <laughs> let's feed Ben again. <laughs> <laughs> now you have a sore bottom. Uh, um I feel I feel like the little brother with this big brother behind me. <laughs> I want to challenge you. I'm Peter. <laughs> My dad can beat up your dad. <laughs> 30 minute game with Peter. Right, right. How um yeah, ben, ben would beat me, yeah, absolutely. Ten times out of ten, we, we'd give that a <laughs> uh, Craig, is, is there a line in the Vienna that causes you trouble? Um, possibly. I actually, the Vienna is one of the openings that just historically causes me trouble. Like, it's not, and it's not even something I'm conscious of. It's just when I see the aggregate opening tree, I realise the Vienna does cause me trouble. Yeah. So let's just look at some of the lines that I've actually faced. Um, if, if, if you guys are happy with that, I mean, I mean this is... 
of interest to me, but I don't know if it's of interest mm-hmm. to everybody. Um, sure. okay. So a- after um, night here, let me just go to my database. So it's, uh, it's just a- somebody suggested to me as well. There's also a, a G3, you know, a Kingside Fianchetto continuation that mm-hmm. I, I, I know I've seen Magnus play and others like that, but yeah. so, I don't think you'd have to prize the, you know, the Vienna Gambit out of my cold dead fingers. That's that's the problem. Yeah, evidently I've never faced G3, at least not in the last 12 months. Um, let me let me just do something here. So I'll just jump into the one that I've been playing more recently on. Now, bearing in mind, the sample size on this account is purely blitz. Three minutes is the longest time control I've played, so it might not be the best yeah. reflection of them. Um, You've got two, two accounts. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, way, you... I looked up becoming an approved streamer the other day, Craig. Okay. And, uh, one of the conditions is that you've got to be PG, so you're not allowed to square. To swear. Right. So uh, I thought, forget that. I thought to myself. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I'm uh, really happy with how this King's Gambit is going. By the way, this uh, C6 line. I don't know if you noticed that. Like extremely. Uh... Yeah, that's all me, mate. That's all <laughs> me. <laughs> That's all the blitz games you won against me. <laughs> um, Although the group did see the blitz game that you nearly lost against me, Greg. This is the line I play against the King's Gambit. Yeah, the, the C6 line. I only found it on opening tree. Um, but, okay, so E5, Knight. So you see, actually, Knight C3 is one of the only openings that's actually causing me trouble, incidentally. Everything else is like 50-50. So knight c3, knight f6. Um, I mean, this is a transposition into the the uh, four knights, so that's actually not too bad. But f4, bishop c4, again, this is the sample size is too small to really make any heads or tails of that. But f4, I've played a few different options here. Again, this is three minutes split, so probably it's just how I'm feeling on the day. But d5 seems natural enough. F takes knight. D5 is clearly the best move, yeah. Queen, knight takes c3. Everyone's playing this Paulson. E takes c3. Yeah. Really Craig, I, I didn't get the time to check, but presumably knight takes there was absolutely the best move for black. Um, As in this is the best move? Yeah, I think yeah. so. Because I think you just lose a pawn otherwise. Yeah, I mean, knight, knight c6 looks to be interesting because... Let's go down this line, see what happens. So it takes. Okay, so in between move, knight d4 seems to be very strong. Oh, I see. Oh, I see. That's I have I've actually studied this line against the pulse and, and mm-hmm. but yeah, this knight c6 is is a is a cunning line. But what's the big idea? Because it just feels like we're still equal. So is there some big trap after, let's just say. I mean, let's just play what the second was coming. Is it going oh. to be? All ah, right. Okay. So you've got this this nice um, queen takes fork. Right. Um, otherwise, if they play knight here. Yeah, I'm starting to. Maybe deteriorate is like not obviously completely crushing. Right, but it does feel like this whole thing. Yeah. Is... So I have to shake someone off any any prep that they've got at least. But yeah, so historically I've always done this, which is what we've seen in the game. Takes c5, uh, d4, c takes. So I've had this twice. And okay, interestingly, I've actually played knight c6 both times. But again, it's the sample's tiny. It's like almost pointless now looking at that. Yeah. But. Queen h4, I think, is what we look. I mean, I just sort of thought we were winning a pawn, but after that, that seemed to defend. But I actually think Queen h4 is the best move. Yeah, you see, that's taking advantage. So Knight c6 is what I've played twice in the past, and it doesn't look to be as strong as just the immediate Queen h4, which is what I'll remember to play going forward, which might actually just address that very small tint that the white has. Okay, I've got I've got another question for you then, Craig. Mm-hmm. Uh, considering that. You've exclusively taught 
um, the advanced kind of group up till this point. Mm -hmm. um, for those who are sub 1,000 right now, because you started around 7,800, eh? Yeah. Um, you started on chess.com. Mm -hmm. In terms of repertoire, which, which openings for white and black do you think gave you the biggest boost? I think a few people would kind of be interested in that. Um, I mean, you know, sub intimate, so, you know, getting up to 1,200, 1,300, which, you know, what helps you the most at that level? What, in terms of opening specifically or just anything? Yeah. 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 Well, if you want. yeah. I mean, the, the, obviously the, 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 the best things like no kind of secret, which is like tactical training. I think that still remains to be the best thing. And I think it's very easy to be, especially at 12, 1300, it's easy to be lazy with that because we think, I mean, I thought, okay, I've, I've done tactics up until now. I've done 600 puzzles. I've done a thousand puzzles. It's all the same. But the benefit of tactics is every single pattern you see imprints like another bit of memory and the aggregate of like 10 or 20,000 puzzles is what really makes a huge difference, I think. So that's probably one of the, in the first year I played in chess.com, I did 10,000 tactical puzzles in one year. And I went from 600 to 1,500. Yeah. Just 10,000 tactical puzzles. Well, I mean, yeah. you know, I know, I know that, you know, without laboring the point, we, we we don't want to stress too much about openings and never really have. Yeah. Too much on chess bootcamp. But um, if, you know, someone is like 8, 900 and they've, you know, been stuck mm -hmm. at 8, 900 for a while and, you know, is there a kind of a, a simple repertoire that you might recommend for openings yeah. to pick this, stick to it, you know, so that you don't have to mess about too much with theory and stuff like that. And, and then you can crack on with learning some middle game ideas. And, you know, this would carry you through to the intermediate level. I mean, or, or even, you know, what are the most maybe flexible openings for both sides? Because there are some... For example, for black, that you can play against D D four or E four, you know, or even C four, you know, sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, the my oh. my zoom kind of cut out a little bit there, but I I think what ultimately what you're saying is for those that are sort of in the breakthrough kind of group eight nine hundred, what would I recommend for them? Um, a hundred percent, I would recommend E four to start with. I used to be a D four player when I first started. And I can't even really call myself a D4 player. I just played one D4. Um, I purely picked that because of the opening statistics said that D4 won like 1% more games. So I was like, okay, that must be the best opening. Um, and uh, E4, the reason why I recommend that, first of all, on a very basic level is because for a beginner, I think it's more important to get used to open positions and dynamic positions where you've got a lot of attacking chances. Whereas D4, although can be tactical and aggressive, typically is more slow and closed. And I don't think that's doing any favours for beginners, such that pretty much every student that comes to me that's under 1,200, they'll play the London system and I'll immediately change them to 1E4. Um, and uh, as for E4 openings, I personally, I, I've made this point, I think I've been on your channel before, um, and I really like the Roy Lopez opening. It's one of these openings where I switched to this at 900, and I've stayed with it to 2100. So it's like, it's carried me all the way through every single bracket. Um, and the reason that I really like it, and I, I particularly recommend the exchange variation, just because it's a very easy opening to learn. So for a beginner, you really want to play an opening that is not, you don't want to be memorizing lines, basically. You want to just um, play a simple opening. And this, this has a nice added benefit that not only is it very, very simple, but there are still a lot of tactical traps for white, um, which is very surprising because it's a, a simple, simple opening, um, which I've went over before, um, uh, just because of this open E file, basically like typical kind of, uh, it, it typically goes something like this. And then general principle, your castle, they're not. So you want to break open the center and you just basically, you just try and clear out the center and exploit the fact that you've got this open, open thing. And so many players mess up this position. Even even my own coach that I've played before um, struggled to find this move, which is F6 is the only move in this position. Everything else is pretty much lost. Because any other move, you just get forked, basically. You either get forked or you lose this. So, so there's just... Uh, it's, and it's... Um, 
you need to appreciate from White's perspective, the it's like a diminishing returns for how often they see the exchange variation. The exchange variation is played like one in seven at the top level. So a lot and a lot of players, like we're all guilty of this, we'll just memorize like the top master opening. So we'll just go deep down the main lines and not really too much on the sidelines. So when you're black, or from black's perspective, they're not used to seeing this as often as bishop back. And then when you get deep into it, like six, seven, eight moves in, they've, they've already basically never seen any of this before. Whereas you see this every single time consistently. So that's that's basically one of the openings I would recommend, at least from white. And it's been good enough to keep me engaged with it for the whole time. Um, and the good thing is that, unlike many other openings, when we eventually simplify everything off, you, ha you have an advantageous end game. So what, one, one way to sort of look at this position would be like this, where um, okay, and then we'll just basically get rid of all of the pieces. Uh, yeah, I, I was going to say, Greg, that the only thing I'd ever heard about like the open Spanish exchange is that like it's not really played at the top level because it's so in some ways beneficial to black, but only in a way that like, you know, yeah. top level player could exploit, right? It's it's a very tactical position, but like, if you know what you're doing is white, like that's, it's like one of the only sort of major openings. Yeah. And I think, I think white avoids it these days because it is so simple. So black can almost guarantee a draw. If right. They correctly. And so if you're playing as white at the high level, you don't want to, play an opening that's going to give you a drawn position and there's like a funny story that i think i heard recent, recently but it's like an old story that i think it was on one of the podcasts um lex friedman and hikaru nakamura they did a podcast where they were talking about kasparov and that kasparov what uh, lost the um right championship to kramnik, kramnik and it's because yeah. he insisted on proving that this this position was winning for white so he played it with all of his white openings and got draws so that he forfeited the chance to play something a bit sharper so that when he was in black like he had to win the black game so basically every time he was white he was drawing and um, because he was trying to prove that this this is basically a berlin end game it's the trans transposed from the exchange variation but the punch structure is a berlin end game uh, so it's quite drawish at the top level but as a practically speaking for anyone of my rating or below it's basically a win for white uh, simple idea is because although it's equal material um Equal, yeah, equal number of pawns, uh, you have a pass pawn and black doesn't. And black cannot ever create a pass pawn on, on this side because um, all you have to do is do this construction with the pawns. And no matter what black does, even if we give them all these free moves in a row, um, you can just waste time and they will never be able to break through. If they take here, you take here and you lock everything up. So all that basically means is you can forget about this entire half of the board and it's only this that you're playing with and that beats that so that's that's a really easy end game so when you're playing the royal lopez exchange not only do you have a few of those tactics at the start of the game you know throughout the entire middle game that your your agenda is winning an end game but is any other opening that you play like the italian or whatever it's maybe not so clear that you fully understand where you're going the entire game so this gives you like a sort of very easy plan from the start you obviously have to practice this end game so that you're comfortable that it's winning. Otherwise, it's pointless going into it. But it's easy, easier than learning a lot of theory, basically. So that's a bit of a long-winded answer. But I just wanted to justify why there's a reason behind why I picked this opening specifically. It wasn't just a random choice that I stuck with it. That's really instructive, Craig. The little bucket there that you did against the four pawns. Yeah. That's fantastic. And on the other side of the board, I'd be trying to play just like F4 to get in if exactly. Yeah, is, is what. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Can you show us that ending on the on the? <clears throat> can yeah. you go through the ending? Yeah, I'll, I'll sort of I'll rattle through it quickly. Then, um, but yeah, in a in a nutshell, like so, I won't play precisely all of the best moves from black and white, but I'll give you the general picture of what will happen at some point or another. You'll activate your king, and they will activate theirs, and so, then you'll push the pawn. Out of yeah. interest as well, um, I think another really good tip of what you did just chuck all the other pieces on the floor and then i mean you could even hit the target icon here and play the ending against yeah. Fisher at any level you want mm -hmm. until you can just annihilate any yeah, feature here and play against the computer from this position yeah yeah but 
But I mean, you can also change, you can switch the computer that you play against. So you could play against a, a 1700 bot or a, a, a 700 bot if you want. Mm. Yeah. That's not, not a bad tip, you know, for end game practice. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, yeah. I mean, keep just amusingly, Craig, it's just a side point. I just looked on their chess.com explorer at your history against the Janish with um, F5 mm -hmm. against the yeah. Spanish, and you're four from 16. You've, you've mm -hmm. only won four from 16 against yeah. that. But that is a lot of bullet. And two, yeah. two games are played against the GM, so you're excused. Yeah. But it um, made me smile. Freddy yeah. Krueger strikes again, Ben. Yeah, and I only recently looked at that in terms of what to do against it, um, so that I had something prepared. Because I think, Peter, you played a couple of times against me in that blitz session, um, and then I looked up like D3 line or something, something a bit more solid, because I think I was just playing sharp, too sharp. But I've, I'm, I'm a bit more comfortable against that now. Yeah, we got um, some funky positions out of that. I lost yeah. the ball, but... We but yeah, as a, as a general sort of time lapse of this type of position, what's typically going to happen is something like, you know, you'll look, I mean, I think it's black's move technically, but um, let me turn legal moves on. Okay, cool. The long story short, you'll launch these kind of pawns up like this, right? And then eventually these will get exchanged off, right? So I need to burn a move here, but let's just say um, something like... Why don't you play it against the machine? Uh, yeah, I could, I could do that. I just hope the machine doesn't play anything funky here. But let's just... But you can see you see the little bot icon, the second icon at the bottom, you can switch. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Uh, how do we turn the engine off? There we go. Um, yeah, so, so, so I mean, this is against 3,200, but this is actually a forced winning end game anyway, so it should be fine. Um, but the point is that we're going to just keep munching along like this, right? And then you, you have this fox in the chicken coup scenario where you'll launch this pawn up and then you, you make a beeline. So you actually give up that pawn. You're not intending to promote with that pawn. You're using it as a diversion, which is very common in end games. Uh, where, again, we actually don't have to take that pawn because wherever it takes us, we take back. It takes here, we take back, and the pawns are fixed. Like so. And then you, you obviously the rest is the rest is um the rest is easy. I mean we can give that point up. Obviously it doesn't really matter. Yeah, it doesn't shouldn't matter here. Yeah, and then the rest the rest is straightforward. But the main the main sort of instructive point is that uh, you're just looking to and this is obviously like an idealistic scenario where you can basically just exchange off all the bonds. Uh, and then the key thing is that you're giving this point up because you don't want to get too fixated on promoting that. You just use it as a decoy. And then you just, it's called the fox in the chicken coup or something like that as a principle. They take that and it allows you to run up and mop everything else up and you promote over here. Um, so again, the end game is basically you're playing an opening where you know all throughout the entire middle game that even if you don't, find any tactics or whatever and it's obviously it's a very idealistic viewpoint of the open of that opening but if um everything seems quite solid and, and equal then ultimately even if you simplify everything off the end game should give you a slight edge basically um but yeah that's that oh huh. yeah it's it's harder than it than i made it look because obviously i'm already like black really should have stopped me like advancing like i, I kind of gave myself a good position to start with um but as a, as a general concept that's what you're trying to do and even though i know that i, I won't win every one of them automatically there'll still be like the odd random obscure king maneuver that keeps me from coming up or whatever but at least if you know this your opponent probably never studied it because they won't voluntarily go into this so you, you'll just always have that little edge cool Yeah, from the, from the black side, like I recommend just e5. I know, like, there's obviously everyone's got their own preference for like. Uh, I I played the Sicilian. I think I started playing the Sicilian when I was eleven hundred, and I didn't actually get into it. I insisted in playing with it, having a worse win rate with it, just because I knew it was supposed to be good, and it wasn't for like three hundred rating points before I finally understood the point of it was. Um, and I just think it's an unnecessary complication to be thinking about. 
I think e just playing E5 is just easier. It frees your brain power up to focus on just general uh, open board tactics, everything else. But um, there's obviously a lot of opening recommendations out there. Carol can French. These are all pretty good at those levels. Um, but I, I, I just know that I would still rather focus my free time on end games or something else than, than openings, usually. Just have, have a general idea, like first five minutes or something. Okay. <clears throat> if anyone's, anyone else has got any questions, please throw in. Um, in Craig, in terms of training, you mm -hmm. know, how much... What percentage of your time right now do you study and what and how would you divide that study compared to play? Mm -hmm. um, it's a little bit different right now because I'm not actually even playing an awful lot. And I'm not like a lot of my free time is spent coaching, basically. So um, but prior to that, because I've plateaued basically since I've been doing that, because I've not really had a lot of time to invest and in continue to improve significantly. But when I was on the rise, basically just say 13, 1400. The amount of time I was putting in there, a lot of my study was YouTube based. It wasn't reading or, or doing courses. Um, just because my learning style, I think it's just YouTube's just well uh, better suited. Um, and um, yeah, like probably 60% actually was probably studying versus playing because I would I'd easily burn like an hour or two on YouTube watching like the climbing the rating ladder stuff or the St. Louis chess club stuff. Um, and then end games and, and, and lessons with my own coach. It was like a mixture, but I'd, it felt like more time was spent learning than, than playing. Um, Blitz also, I mean, I if you look at my stats, I've actually predominantly played Blitz during my entire uh, progression. And I think I actually do rate Blitz, even though it's like un, unpopular for, for improving, just from a different perspective, which is the pattern recognition angle again. So it's like a lazy way to, to, to develop, but it, it does work to some extent, um, which is just getting lots and lots of exposure to blitz games because you can refine your openings really, really quickly. And um, again, it's just like pattern recognition. It's like a lot of cheap, cheap sort of shallow positions over and over again, and it makes you a good blitz player, but it does sort of hinder you for rapid games because you're not disciplined to think deeply. Um, but a lot of players just say you can't improve with Blitz at all, but it still indirectly made me a better player overall by playing pretty much exclusively Blitz. But um, I do think, obviously, the Rapid games are, are better suited to learn properly. But that's just what I did. Right. Do you play day um, or, or any longer games? So yeah. there's not plenty of days yeah. or three days. Again, that's really useful just to get your sort of thinking down and your thought process down and playing the best quality chess you can play. I just never, ever did that. Um, again, probably just for the whole instant gratification thing. I just never really wanted to play uh, long games. I just didn't personally get enjoyment from them. So I think my daily stats have probably got like, I don't know, less than 100 games out of 10,000 total. Um, rapid games is probably only 10% of my total pool. I think like 90% it will be Blitzer Bullet. But um, as long as you're you're like the the, the 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 negative of playing Blitz is just if you play Blitz and instantly rematch and just instantly rematch, you get a lot of value from going over what went wrong in the Blitz games um, and looking for any basic tactics that you missed and making sure you drill that type of tactic. It's, as long as you're doing some kind of like reflective analysis on it, then Blitz games are useful. But if you're just rematching, then obviously it's completely pointless, I would say, because you're just not getting any value. You're just playing games after games, not thinking and then not even seeing where you went wrong. Um, but yeah, rapid games, I think the bulk of my rapid games are 10 minute games, which again, I know are quite fast. But I, like, I think if I was to do it all over again, like I really keep saying to myself that I should be starting to play rapid, like 15 minute games minimum, because I really want to improve at the next, like the next kind of level. And I think that's the next thing that will help me, which is the deeper thinking. So, which uh, obviously, with the exception of chess bootcamp and uh, and chess goals, which would be the um, your recommended chess YouTube channels for people at different levels. Yeah. Well, again, I I spent most of my time on YouTube like twenty nineteen when um, 
I think there's probably a lot of new channels that have popped up that are now really popular. But John Bartholomew's climbing the rating ladder thing and climbing the tactics rating ladder thing, those are like the standard responses, but they're like six years old, but they are, they're obviously still pretty good. I know these days Daniel Naraditsky does a very comprehensive um, kind of climbing the rating ladder equivalent where he dedicates a full video just to one game or one or two games. Um, I know that's pretty good. I know, Ben, you've mentioned before that that's part of your um, sort that's, of routine. That's my breakfast viewing every day. I, do. Um, I know that, uh, Coach Andres, that guy, um, his videos have actually been refreshing to me just by how blunt he is. Um, so I've been, I've quite enjoyed some of those. Andres Toth, I think his name is. So if you've never heard of him, I check him out. He's just quite straight to the point. To me, to me, he feels like, yeah, advanced players would yeah. be better with him. Like seventeen hundred. Yeah, yeah, def- yeah, probably. Yeah, I think yeah. Um, but yeah, that and Eric Rose and stuff like my my biggest improvement from seventeen hundred to two thousand came from opening work. Whereas I wouldn't really have put opening work as the single biggest factor in my improvement prior to that point. And it was just by trying to to make a, a more concerted effort to play sidelines and lines that are not the strongest objectively, but they've got a lot of practical play. Like I think that's that that also keeps it really fun, like for like Ben and James and anyone else that's sort of on the verge of wanting to climb to the next level, is if I was to do one thing over again, it would be to avoid main lines. Because you spend all your time learning like the King's Indian main line is black. And then you're always going to face people who know better than you because it's like this standard opening. Uh, whereas if you play something like this Charlotte Gambit, for example, you'll no one will put a serious amount of time as white studying how to fight that and spark people out quite easily. If you if you play things like that where they're, they're um, kind of off book, off beat. Um, so that's probably what we do in reflection is play kind of sidelines. So um, that's that's one thing to look at. Like like if you're, even if you're playing something mainstream like the Sicilian or the Caro or the French, just play a sideline version of it. Um, that will work wonders. Do you follow uh, like Big Mio, the butcher? Uh, no, I I don't really. Um, but I know who he is. I've seen him on Chesper's channel before. Um, he's like he kind of affiliates with them, and I've seen one or two of his videos. I think he's got a video on like the French defence, that kind of French defence I played before. Mm. And I think he played like the Queen sack line of the England Gambit, which when I used to play that, he played it in a little bit, but it's it's definitely objectively too dodgy now. The Charlotte Gambit is superior. He's de- he's definitely got a... Uh, yeah, he's a, he's a bit of ginger GM about him. He, he likes very, very spicy and gambity. Mm. Another guy who got... Hello, Stefan, Stefan here. Um, I can't remember what his channel's called now. The but Croatian he, guy. Yeah, he's very good for hanging pawns. Hanging pawns. Yeah, he's yeah. really he's really good for theory. So again, probably you know no, no one below intermediate should be. Yeah, you know, thinking about that. Um, have you ever checked out the uh, Building Habits series from Chessboro? Uh, I haven't, um, but I've heard good things about that. Just I think just because I think the habits kind of stopped around about my like maybe two thousand ish or something like that, nineteen hundred. So I never really looked at them too deeply, but. Um, but yeah, I've heard, heard good things about it. Um, I'd be interested actually what might be valuable as well for the last five minutes is if, if you can each of you just give me like a snapshot of your own study routine and can maybe give you some thoughts on that where you're spending your time. Like, who, like yeah, Ben, what are you currently doing to develop, for example? I, I, I play too much. I play too yeah. many games. And again, I just hit new game. Yeah, uh, I mean, sometimes if something catches me by surprise, I will go and I, you know, I'm I'm a huge fan of uh, Lee Chess's studies and particularly mm-hmm. the interactive lesson analysis mode is really really cool, mm-hmm. drilling stuff. Um, I like that. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll watch probably half an hour to an hour a day of YouTube videos. Um, I don't do enough drills. I don't do enough, you know, puzzles or practicing difficult things because i'm lazy and old Mm -hmm. basically yeah yeah i mean and that's that's pretty much the reason why i didn't play rapid because i was just too lazy but you can still get value from from obviously as long as you're still doing some kind of analysis like as long as you're still analyzing your rapid games you'll still get value from playing obviously 
Um, and I think it's really important, especially at your rating level, to always come back to like the databases as well and just see like where the sidelines are, because there's a lot of gold in those sidelines, which is what I would recommend. Um, what about everyone else? But just on you, Ben, before we, we move on, like how much time have you, because another another big area I think is a huge opportunity for people in your rating range is pawn structures. Like if I'm going to play someone, it, it kind of, when I go to these things in London at the weekend and they, they tell me they're 15 or 1600, if I don't blow them off the board with a tactic, it's almost always taking their pawns apart, backwards pawns, or they make incorrect breaks. So that's another big area that if you were to put some time in that, you'd probably find that you have an advantage over the equivalent rating because they wouldn't have understand it. Mm. Yeah, so yeah. pawn breaks is a good area to look at. Yeah, sorry, pawn structures, not pawn breaks. Pawn breaks is a subset, and that's, that's good as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's not really anything that I've, again, drilled or studied. Yeah. And it's quite a broad concept, but if you just start by looking at like pawn structures and just see see what people are saying about it. Um, but yeah, pawn structures is a pretty good area to look at. James, what do you do? So I, I play rapid. I try not to play too much blitz and bullets. I don't want to get into that instant gratification thing, yeah. which I feel myself slipping into. As soon as I stop playing blitz, I stop analysing and I'm just like, uh, I'm fully monged out and fuzzy in the head. But yeah, I play rapid and analyze. <laughs> and um, yeah, that's all I do, really. I, I need to do more puzzles. Um, I played a game today that I, I made 13 blunders. So I'm, I'm going to try have another look at that one because that was bad for me. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Um, how much time have you put into pawn structures, for example? Um. <sighs> I, f I don't know, but I feel like I'm better at that side of things than I am the tactical side. Mm. You, yeah. you, I, I always think of you as a positional player, James. So yeah. in that case, then, like, if you're drilling tactics, like, it's, it's obviously smart to not just drill them aimlessly, like, which is what I did. Um, but if I was to do it all over again, I would do it more efficiently. So the checkmate patterns, I'm definitely a huge believer in that. So, like, the checkmate patterns manual on Chessable or a free equivalent on Lee Chess. But doing those group things, like, um, Greco mate, for example, hook mate, all that stuff. Even if you've seen the pattern, you know what it is. Just getting more and more exposure to repeat patterns is 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 really good because I feel like I see them quite often when I'm playing my games, or I've got a concept of it, even if it doesn't quite kick off. Um, it just gives me more purpose behind a lot of the the moves. If you see like a, the concept of a mating net, um, so you've got a lot of value there. Um, end games as well, like king and I, I spent like a disproportionate amount of time when I was 15, 16, 1700 blitz level playing rook end games and king and pawn end games um because i think again like it's just it's so easy when you've got like a, a slightly better position but you've got a, a rook end game that you know and the opponent doesn't um so that's 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 be useful to study as well if you don't if you're not entirely like if you if you think you couldn't do it in autopilot like play the, the standard rook endings that's really the stage you want to study it to the extent that you can play it in autopilot right well, well, up on time, so it's, yeah. it's the wrap. Unless anyone else has got anything else to ask, yeah, it's a very good session, Craig. Thank you, excellent. Yeah, nice, Thanks, really. Great. Yeah. Great. I, Glad I, you liked I, it. I hated half of it, but uh, the second half picked up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Just take it as a good lesson. Brilliant. Thanks, everyone. Cool. Thank Thanks you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Craig. Session, everyone. Bye bye. Cheers.